Um, up next, we have two of Australia's top coaches in formation skydiving and free flying. Um, you might have heard of both Melissa Harvey from Supercharge and Aussie Big Ways, and also Mason Corby from Down Under Dynamics. Um, they not only lead the way in body flight skills and coaching, but they're also fantastic mentors for coaches in their field. So I'm going to let hand it over to Melissa and Mason. Thanks for joining us. Yay. Thanks, Oops. Jules. Um, yeah, cheers, Jules. Yeah, so greetings, everyone. Mason and I are going to do something a little bit different today and actually share the presentation and the discussion with you. Um, we've had a lot of fun putting this together because we've realized that in actual fact, we, we are the same across our disciplines and we have the same challenges and the same opportunities. So it's really fun to actually present something to you that is sort of discipline agnostic um, and, uh, and focused on, on our community. Um, so thanks very much. Um, let me just share my screen. Uh, the host is disable participant screen sharing. So perhaps the host could undisable that. Who's the host? No. Nope. Is I it just like looking into that now? Wade. Try that one. Thank you. That's beautiful. Let me just find it. I'm just going to pop it on the, well, the slideshow and lose the speaker sounds. There we go. So hopefully you can, you can see that slide and we're just going to use slides to support our conversation. So again, thanks for joining us today. I'm just going to start by asking you to visualize something. <laughs> Why will nobody play with me? Picture this scene, sad boy, sad girl. You've just finished your B-Rails and you're ready to be the new Boomerang Betty or the new Focus. But you're not being invited on those teams and your jumps with friends are fun, but all those funneled exits and zooming around each other is actually getting quite frustrating and quite boring. More experienced people and instructors just keep telling you to go and do more fun jumps. Try again, but they're not fun when you don't know how to get better. How many people do you know, if not yourself, who've been in that situation? So we're inspired to start jumping for lots of reasons, right? And top left-hand corner, AFF, absolutely fantastic way to start. It's brilliant. It teaches you to survive. It gives you all the skills you need, right? To get out into the sport. But really, um, after that, you kind of want to score more points or you want to be involved in bigger things. Um, compete, maybe be invited to events. So you do actually still need to develop your skills. But things have changed a little bit since Mason and I started in the sport and it's not so easy anymore to do that or it seems that way. So Mason, what's your student to skydiver story? Yeah, well, for me, I was I started about 14 years ago. I think uh, probably looking at the names on here, a lot of you other guys have started probably even earlier than me. But what I've probably seen um, is when I started jumping back then, it was a lot more of a club mentality. We had a lot more family orientated drop zones, and it wasn't as it was still big and scary coming in quite young to a, a scene you haven't don't know anyone in. But at the same time, there was big time club culture. Um, we could generally pair up with a friend and get teaching from the locals and yeah, it was a lot easier. Whereas I find now these days, it's a bit more daunting for people when they come to a drop zone and they don't know anyone and there's a turbine drop zone with nonstop people going, jumping all the time and it's a lot harder for people to kind of generally approach them I find um, compared to back in the day where you didn't really have to approach anyone. It was just a family. People kind of generally came up and approached you from what I found generally. Um, it is different at certain different drop zones from what I've seen, but I think the general majority from what I've heard from a lot of people is that seems to be the culture these days, I think. So it's, yeah, a little bit, little bit harder. Yeah. It's different. I was a little bit the same. I was at the Scottish Parachute Club. It was a club environment. We had a Cessna. Um, everybody was kind of in it together. You back through your, your static line and your, 
progression jumps and then you came out the other end and then you just made things happen together. But these days things are just a little bit different because mm. you can't necessarily rely on people and things are a bit more um, commercial, if you like. Um, so quick question, just so that we kind of know who's, who's with us today. Um, do you want to just uh, put your thumb up or maybe put something on chat if you're a, an instructor or a coach? What have we got? Just scanning the, scanning the people. Thumbs, keep your thumbs up if you're an instructor or a coach. Yeah, probably a good 50-50, I'd say. Yeah. Even though, even though there's a lot of names there where <laughs> there's no screen. But I, know, <laughs> I think I know a lot of those guys as well. Cool, so it's about 50-50. So that's pretty good. And then everybody else is involved in skydiving in some way, shape or form, yeah? That's cool. Well, what we're gonna talk about today, um, Mason, do you wanna just take us through the agenda for, for today? Yeah, cool. So uh, we're gonna talk about the four key areas of body flight. Uh, so we'll go through them soon. Exit presentation, hill work, approach and dock, axis control and break off. And as I said, we'll go through all this a little bit more in detail in a sec. Um, instructors and coaches, how can we help? So just going through how as instructors and coaches, the different ways we can help those novice guys in just giving them a bit more of a, a path of progression, I guess. Um, and then, yeah, same thing, everyone just be included. So same as the above instructors and co coaches, how we can help them, but how also other people can include others and the best way to save time, money and effort because there are some shortcuts we can all make rather than, than being a bit difficult. And then we're going to go through a bit of uh, Q and A as well. So if everyone has some, anyone has some questions, we did have a question that we got given, um, and we'll go through that one at the end, uh, which is was a quite a good question. So <laughs> it was. Thanks, thanks, Robo. So it looks like we sort of tuned in a bit to the audience, which is good because this is really very much about instructors and coaches. How can you help the people that you're you're helping out through the sport? And also, if you're just in the sport and you're trying to progress, how do you actually do that? Um, without without sort of stumbling and falling out of the sport, which is very sad. Um, so we know who you are. Um, now let's have a look at us. So from a young age, we were clearly destined for greatness. And I've always wondered what Mason has got and he's stuck in his mouth. What is that? It's a lemon because I eat lemons. <laughs> when life gives you lemons, eat them. <laughs> that is so cool. So. So there he is, he's ready to go, ready to take on the world, as was I with my fairy wand. Um, but in actual fact, there's a little bit more to us now. Mason, what's your passion? What, what are you here to share? Um, so free flying and skydiving. I wouldn't say free flying. I'd say free flying is what I'm good at and what I'm probably known for, but I just like skydiving. I like anything to do with flying a body, getting out of the plane, belly, free fly, aft, tandems, first timers in the tunnel. Um, I do a couple DD camps. Uh, that teaches beginners, uh, beginner free flyers all the way through advanced. And um, yeah, I just like flying pretty much. I can't help it. Pretty cool. Yep. Well, my passion is four way. If anybody knows me that well, four way, anything FS, also most recently big waves, and particularly helping people with what I've termed personal flying skills. Because as we'll discover today, unless you can fly your own body, then it's very hard to fly relative to somebody else, no matter what attitude you're actually at. Um, so that's where I've sort of pushed my, myself in the last few years, um, opening up supercharged programs. But basically, like Mason, I love skydiving and I'm even learning to sit fly. So that's on a bit of a hold on the basis of COVID. And I'll just shut the window because somebody's actually mowing the lawn. Um, but, uh, but, but yeah, we're, we're here because we've got experience to share, but also because we realize it's kind of the same things that people are struggling with. Um, so. To Mason's point, we've got four key areas of body flight that we wanted to share with you. And we're kind of going to take it in turns to lead a section, um, but make sure that we've got the conversation in, in, the, in all disciplines. Um, and if you've got any major questions, maybe use the chat function, and then we can try and pick them up on the topic or pick them up at the end. Happy? Yeah. First one, no surprise. <laughs> Exit presentation and hill work. So this is mine to start with because I feel so strongly that if you have a look at the photograph at the background of the slide, does anybody know who that is? I do. Who is it? That's Marshall, right? 
It's actually Doug Ford. Oh. But Marshall probably looks the same. Um, beautiful, articulated body part. Well, Doug Ford, you can tell the orange helmet and the orange jumpsuit. Um, stunning exit presentation. Strong and stable in the relative way. He's immediately able to control the air, which means he's going to get there quickly. You can see in the background, he's looking for that, that base. He's already on the way. His, bo his body is already in control of the wind. So what we tend to see, no matter what discipline you're in, is sometimes as a student progressing into the skydiver mode, often there's a lack of awareness on exit. They're just learning to become aware of the air and themselves in it. And that instability, that sort of lack of awareness leads to time and altitude being lost as they struggle to actually get themselves on the wind and use the wind for their own uh, benefit so that they can control it. And we often see people really struggling with that and that means that people don't want to jump with them. They know they're gonna be wasting their time. Um, it's money spent and, and lost. So what can you do? Well, as you move up your student status, it's a good idea to actually practice setting up in the door and actually becoming really strong and deliberate with your body movements as you leave the door. It's also important to build air awareness. And like Mason and I have talked a lot about how you can actually help somebody feel the air, um, whether it be using the tunnel or just in a skydive, you're actually out there feeling the pressure in the air. And you can do that also with learning how to use your body parts in Pilates, and yoga and learning to articulate your body parts. So if I think about what can happen, and apologies to the military personnel here, it's just too good a photograph. Um, if, if the exit is unstable or the exit presentation is poor, then people often end up at different altitudes to each other. They're really struggling to actually maintain stability and it's not easy to actually get back together again. What we are aiming for is something a little bit more static on the air, where you're presented on the hill. And if you notice that somebody's body parts are actually fairly articulated, then something like yoga or Pilates will actually help in, in actually learning what your body parts are and doing and get that muscle um, articulation as opposed to being strong and static on the air. So actually practicing those kind of things so you get muscle awareness and then learning how to actually be more aware of the pressure of the air as you're flying. You can see here on a big way exit too, a great photograph, you can see how people tend to bump into each other. So getting that awareness and that stability in your exit so that you can actually deal with that um, bumping and that being pushed around on the air. Um, and you can see here, we've also got a different aircraft. We've got a sky van and we've got a, a side door exit in the water um, where the exit presentation needs to be different. So as a student, you've often got the ability to leave the plane and just sort of look after yourself and then think about somebody else. So as you evolve in your jumping, we're trying to encourage people to actually do more to gain your awareness. So if somebody says to you, go and do another fun job, what can you focus on? Focus on the exit, focus on your awareness, focus on your appreciation and anticipation and the feel of the air. And it's no different in uh, Mason's world, is it? No, not at all. It's, it's the exact same. As you can see from this picture, a lot of the legs are facing into the relative wind, whereas on the belly, it's going to be the belly because these guys are exiting head up. As you can see also, there's a lot of people cooking the exit and haven't really done a good exit. So this brings me to the next point. For those who are teaching people who, how to track or belly or angles or anything, a lot of the things that I see with students in the beginning is they beat themselves up because they don't have a good exit. A lot of the time their question is, why didn't I do an exit good? Why did that go wrong? Why did this? And they miss the fact that that X they did took them in this position. So rather than being just aware of what the right thing is, be aware of the wrong things. So if you do do a horrible exit or if your student does a horrible, horrible exit, if they do two or three in a row, at least if they're aware of that, that uh, body movement is going to cause this reaction. That way they can at least go, okay, well, this does this. I'm going to try something different because a lot of the time what I see a lot of people doing, whether it's tunnel, skydive, free fly, flat, whatever, 
is they will do the same mistakes over and over and over and over and over again, expecting a different result. Now, as you expect a different result, it's generally this is because they don't know, they think, I'll, I'll rephrase this, sorry. Uh, they haven't done this move before, so they see other people doing the same move and they expect the same result to happen to them. Yet their body awareness might not be at the stage where they're able to uh, see what reactions are happening because they just don't have the awareness there yet. So to build awareness, they need to, to get out, do, do the exit if it's horrible, and then just be aware, okay, this is where that takes me. So rather than trying to change it and do a perfect exit, get them to do the same exit, do a horrible one, a horrible one, and then slowly change from that horrible one to a, a slowly a better one, rather than trying to make drastic changes straight away. And this can cause them to just have 10, 15 different horrible exits because they're just trying different things rather than being aware of the one solid thing that they're doing and trying to manipulate this very slowly back into a, a correct direction rather than just trying randomly these different things that are going to fix it. Coaching helps this for sure too. Um, so yeah, just, I think that's a, a big one for when you are working on exits or anything, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat myself with this multiple times in this, in this brief is just awareness um, and being aware of what you're actually doing and not beating yourself up over doing the wrong thing. If you do the wrong thing, or there is no right or wrong, but if you do something that isn't expected, just at least be aware of what that, that reaction or that movement did cause and not, not be so much, damn, why didn't that work? But what happened there? So more of an experimentation, an experimentation attitude rather than a, why didn't this work attitude? And Mason, I can't see the, the chat function because I've got the, the slideshow going for it. Is there anything there from anybody on this topic before you move on to the next one? No, just go military, we aim to please. Certain stuff <laughs> like this. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right. Uh, do you want to take us on to the next one? Yes, I can. So where are we at? All right, so the next one's axis control. So proximity flying, flying in your own space, control position moves. So a lot of this stuff we kind of learn in B-rolls and stuff like this. So these things, it, it all goes through all disciplines from what I've found. You want to have proximity in your flying and flying your own space in, in head down and sit fly as well. Um, controlling your precision moves. So as, as Melissa said before, a lot of these stuff really do cross over. Um, Obviously, we don't want to be reaching for grips on the belly or head down or anything like this. So trying to drill these exercises into people in the beginning is probably key. So when you're diving down to a formation, making sure they do control all their axes. Learn uh, in the beginning, a lot of people will steer just with their arms and learn to turn with their arms. So inform students when you're turning with your arms, you might turn around a different axis. That's okay, that's fine. Just this is what happens and be aware that's that what happens. Then same thing with the legs. I generally try to, when I'm teaching people, I will try to not teach, jump ahead and teach knee turns, belly, like arm turns and then center point turns. I'll get them to really be solid in one thing. So focusing just on the arms, they can turn just with the arms. Once they've mastered this, then tell them to forget about the arms don't incorporate them focus solely on the legs once they're fully solely focused on the arms and then we can combine the both so th this can work different for us but i found from teaching first time is in the tunnel to free fly in the sky to free fly in the tunnel or, or tracking or anything it's the same theory so if they're doing belly turns in for example with their arms this might be in skydiving they might be doing turning on a tracking with their hands. So they're now turning, tracking with their, arm, their shoulders and their hands rather than their legs. Once they have the control of their arms, then we can get them to control with the legs. This is why I don't like to say there's a right or a wrong, a wrong way. There's just many, many ways, many ways to skin a cat. So if you're, you find a student that's hard and they're not really quite getting it, look at their position and go, what for them is more natural? And do that. Once they've mastered the natural position, then we can start working on the hard things. So it's just that stage of progression that I find is a lot easier than trying to go for the ideal uh, turning on the belly on axis through the core each time. Let them let them go wide. Let them control wide as long as they're aware of what they're doing with this. Um, so same as you can see down the bottom of the side, build awareness, find your center point, experiment with the legs, arms, chest. So it's exactly what I've just uh, talked about there. Um, 
what we don't want to do obviously is moving away, wasting time, bumping into people and unstableness. So you can see here with the next picture, we've got on the left hand side, the axis of control, a good student, nice arch there. And then we'll see on the right, he's turning with his arms, so not so much the legs. So you'll see the main axis point that he'll pivot around is most likely going to be the legs and the knees because the turning is coming from the front part of the body. If he was using his knees here, as most of you know, because he's an instructor, he's then going to pivot more around the torso rather than the other. And you'll see down the bottom, same thing, two girls doing sit flight. They are slightly different positions. Okay, so this is why I say as well, positions don't necessarily mean right or wrong. It's just because different body shapes, sizes, weight, all sorts of things like this in free flight will cause different people to have different body positions. So that's why if you, one person may be really skinny and their position might look different. So as a, as a coach or someone, really take awareness of their, their weight and size and not the ideal position of what we think is right or wrong, because that will change due to people's size and shape, for sure. Um, what was the next slide, Melissa? I think that was. Ah, so this next one is axis control uh, on angles. So you can see here, uh, I think it's Jason Dodonsky. He's coming quite close to, um, uh, I've lost his name, Reed. Uh, so this is what we're talking about as well as flying your own space. So not only just on belly flying and formation, flying your slot, making sure you're not bumping into each other, but this comes in, as you can see, with angles as well. So right now, Jason may get feel a bit burbled and then that could bump him into a different position and cause some wobbles throughout the formation as well. So ideally, you're really focusing on slot specifics So make sure you fly your slot and then you can use your, your arms or your legs in whichever way you need to do it to turn. So you'll see in this picture as well, You, if you can look, you can uh, see Reed who's leading, who has the blue sleeves. Um, you'll see, it looks like he's using his hands a little bit more to steer. You'll see the right hand of his is quite cupped. Whereas if you see Jason, his arms are quite back. So I'd say he's probably more steering with his hips, not so much his legs. And then the two back guys are steering a bit more with their arms. So you can see there's, there's many different ways to steer. I don't like to say right or wrong because if one person just, if we always say straight legs, then people are going to have straight rigid legs and they won't have any control over it. So learning to control multiple, multiple different areas of the body is probably the key. And as Melissa said, a lot of yoga, a lot of meditation, Pilates, just bringing awareness to the body. Swimming really helps with this where we're just using another form of, dynamics so like fluid dynamics compared to aerodynamics it's the same thing it's just a, a thicker form of that gas which turns into a liquid so uh swimming and stuff really helps as well learns lets you learn to move your body a lot more fluidly um and then the next slide i think is for you melissa so yeah brilliant everything you've said i've also found people that love uh trying things out on the trampoline because if you're lying on your belly on a trampoline and you press mm -hmm. down on the trampoline you get the pressure of the, the trampoline so all these things are free so swimming tends to be free you can go in the ocean trampoline free yoga tends to be free you get stuff on the internet you know all these things you can recommend to your students and you can do yourself to actually really help body awareness this is an awesome picture i love it um it, it just what we're trying to show here to Mason's point is that we actually need varied access control. So although we try and start to find out where our center point is, as people try and find out where they're actually going to fly neutral straight down the tube, so to speak, as you actually progress and you're flying, you're looking to use your head, your legs. Often you can't use your arms because you're holding on to somebody. Um, and the one thing I would offer from a student perspective as you're coaching people or instructing people and taking them forward is the focus on the head. So one of the real challenges is when people come to us, um, I certainly often find that they tend to go where they look. So what I would offer is an opportunity in your coaching and your teaching, not changing any of your syllabus, but just offering people an explanation of access control and all the different places you can turn around. And the fact that if you are a human being, you often go where you're looking. But when you're a skydiver, you actually want to get awareness around your whole body so that, as you can see, Kate on the bottom right here is actually sliding her body on her center point but holding the piece together so that she uses her legs to actually translate through the center of the formation. If she took the piece where she was looking, then the piece would move apart and we wouldn't stay quite so close. So that's what I like about that sort of picture there and 
one of the opportunities, I think, when we're teaching students holistic access, appreciation and understanding, and it doesn't change what you're teaching in the, in the app and email syllabus. So, uh, oh, just as I move forward, again, Mason, keep your eye on the chat because I can't see it. Yep. Um, anything? Uh, anything repeatable? No, not really. Uh, Kate Vaughan just wants to know, can you say which is the name in the pics, please? Ta. So I think we just the done name. that. Yeah. So who, who, who's in them? Oh, well, Kate Vaughan, you're in this picture. You're in the bottom <laughs> right. <laughs> We've got Anne Marie um, in in the uh, in the piece with Kate, and then we've got myself on the top left and Miss Anderson in the bottom left. So Not me. I was just looking for like a twelve o'clock, three o'clock thing. Oh, uh, okay. On the free flyers, so I wasn't sure who they were. Thanks. Ah, uh, no worries. <laughs> yeah, names are important. Um, so I get to to introduce approach and doc, which is our third topic. So these are like the key things you can be helping students. Um, understand as they transition off the formal instruction and into their own skydiving, what is important. If they can focus on these things, then they can be included a little bit more often. So coming into DOT, we all know what it's like. If somebody's zooming around, not only are we going to get hit, but it takes up time, the formation doesn't complete. Um, maybe people get bumped into each other, they pass the formation and grab something as they go drag it down, maybe even go in through the top. My God, who's been there? Um, it all happens when people are learning. So what we're ideally asking people to focus on is doing the kind of practice that allows them to dedicate themselves to really focusing on coming in in a straight line or on your radio as you describe it, managing their levels. So this is a different axis. This is this sort of up and down axis. Um, and being able to continue to fly so that when they pick up the grip, they're not flying off the grip. So not changing anything sort of in your syllabus, how you communicate to a student what the grip is for, is absolutely fundamental. It's typically for scoring a point. It's not for survival, stability, or joining onto the formation and hold, you know, it's holding you there. So continuing to fly, avoiding actually sinking and lifting on grips. And the way to kind of do that often is again free. It's about visualizing your plan, managing your, your mental awareness and your calm. As competitors, a lot of people on this call as well, you know, being comfortable getting somewhere and not rushing to pick up the grip. But if you're in a big formation, making sure that you're strong, you're stable, you're not going to cause grief when you actually pick it up. So visualizing and planning your approach so that you don't get panicked into, into grabbing the grip. Prioritize your stopping. And again, you can really help students significantly in their transition if on the V-rails, you actually ask them to stop before they pick up. It would be huge. Simple thing. Just make sure they stop in position and then pick up the grip. And learning your range. Wow, this is a big topic and a scary one. How many people have I met who've just been told that all they need to do is arch harder. Yes. Hey guys, I rely on you to build our community. If you pump people out of the system and they're so fused in an arch that they can't use their arms to pick up a grip, it's not gonna help. I really understand when drop zone operators and CIs say to me, the student must learn to fly their own body. That's critical. In which case, if they're a really light student and you're a heavier instructor and there isn't a suit suitable for you, find someone else to teach that student. Let them fly in their neutral range so that they're not flying at extremes. Yeah. Um, and a little bit later on, when you feel comfortable and it's appropriate in your drop zone and with their canopy size and everything else, you can give them a little bit of lead. Lead is your brain. Um, here's a great picture. Um, approaching and docking. Everybody lined up on their radial. Some of the body positions are a little bit interesting. You can see even stretch at eight o'clock in the uh, long stretchy body, black jumpsuit, white and blue rig. Even he's just getting a little bit bigger and he's using his legs to cup air because guess what? A six-way compress holds like hell. <laughs> 
But this mm. is the kind of thing that people aim for, to be able to approach, hold their line, hold their level, so that they can actually play with other people. And I think, Mason, you've got something? On yeah, this? I'll go back to, uh, you said something before, that I was going to go, but that's right, the arching. So this is something I see a lot with students. Like I've, I've probably done 300 aft jumps and coached thousands of people, first timers in the tunnel. And the quickest way we found for people to progress was to fly their natural body weight, hands down. In the tunnel, it was really quick. Luckily, we can do this by adjusting the speed to them. Whereas in the sky, it's a lot harder. We can't really adjust the speed to them because uh, they are the speed. Whatever speed they fall at is what they fall at. Whatever speed the instructor falls at is what they fall at. So finding the most natural body position for them is extremely important in the beginning. This way, they don't have to worry about so much necessarily arching. They can just worry about their controls of their axis. They can worry about falling faster, slowly, and falling slower. So they find that middle range. Once they have control of that middle range, then I find they can go faster a lot easier because they're not questioning themselves going, am I going faster? Am I not going faster? And then worrying about all these speed controls. So it's extremely important. That's the same with free flying, all this kind of stuff as well. So you see here in the picture, Exactly as Melissa was saying about the approach level dock, it's the same same theory on heading, flying to the slot. And one of the biggest things that really helped me when I was doing this and learning um, to, to do these exact points of these guys coming in and approaching on a, on a big formation was Erica Noodle. Uh, she, I was having really difficulty flying up and getting the dock and I kept reaching and freaking out and trying to breathe and panic and all the blood was gone on my head. And she said something as simple as, which I'm sure many of you have been told is just breathe get to the formation stop take a big breath and dock and i think that's for me the biggest thing is the mindset and the mind state of the people jumping we'll find when we're we're jumping this is experience guys too when we start getting stressed and we get to a point where something in the jump plan didn't go right and something completely different happened straight away when we're falling it anywhere from 100 to 300 kilometers an hour. So our, our heart rate and our mind's already racing. But then to add a stuff up on, on top of that, now the minds start wandering a lot. So really having good control of the mind space and allowing the students to do that really, really improves their skydiving tenfold, massively, I find. So there's many, many ways to prepare it. That can be another, another topic all in itself. Um, but I think really going through the jump and visualizing that dock, visualizing the process that happened and being able to confidently have backup plans to, if something does happen, what am I going to do on this? Am I going to back off from the jump and let everyone else get it, get in there? Or am I going to go for it? And do I have the skills to, to, to dive back down, get on level and then approach again. So having these backup plans for them and even for yourself is really important. That way, you know, if you do sink out, do I get out of there? If I'm high, do I get out of there? Or do I go back and try to get on level and get in? So that's really, really important. But the main thing for approach level dock, same as belly, head levels first, then approach. LSD, level, slot, dock. Um, and you'll find, so this is, you're seeing the belly one and this is the vertical one. If you go to the next slide for us, Melissa, you're going to see the same thing for angles. Okay, so the head levels are pretty much the same you see the head levels i'm in the middle okay i think i'm not sure who that is under us and we have two on the side but you'll see here it's the same level slot dock the head levels are the same with myself and same with the back guys and this is key okay same for angles if you're off level you don't necessarily have the problem of uh a docking issue because generally in angles we're not so much docking anymore these days which i do think it's highly important that we do go back and learn how to dock on angles. I think it's going to let us fly our slots a lot better. But at the same time, if you're off level on an angle, generally either you're going to be endangering burbling people and having the possibility of corking into them. Or if you're on off level, the other option is you'll have the danger of people burbling you and corking into you. So uh, really think about LSD level slot dock. It's important for, all disciplines uh same with wingsuiting same with i'm sure with uh canopy stuff as well uh jules may pick me up on this one i don't know but i'm pretty sure their levels slot and dock is probably the same it's just their levels may be slightly different than what ours are but i'm guessing it's the same brilliant um, 
Hey, before I move on to your next the, the topic you're going to mm-hmm. open up with, can I just pick up on something they just said? Yeah, for sure. Because it's so key. You know, when we move away from being a student and we're in charge of our own skydiving and we're part of groups and organized teams, what do we do the most of? Planning, visualization, diving. And I totally understand that sometimes on a commercial drop zone, it's very hard to give the students time to think. You know, you're often rushing. But what you can offer them, and again, it's free, is the chance to just do a little bit of homework. Their time with you might be quite rushed um, if it's not possible to give them time to prepare and think. Um, But they can do homework. They can pre-plan their jumps. They can look at what's coming. They can do some visualization and preparation themselves and actually come prepared to the dirt dive with you rather than it all being a rush and a flurry. Um, That would, I think, help a lot of people. Yeah, um, definitely. So sorry, I just think that's... No, no, that, that's perfect. I'll, I'll touch on that real quick again. What people do on the ground is what they do in the sky. Hands down. Every time. If I see someone walking, doing a head down jump, and they're walking the head down jump like this, 95% of the time, they're going to do the head down jump with their shoulders above their head. If that's how they do the dirt dive, they're going to do the same in the sky. So it's very hard as a coach sometimes to pull people up on that. Because a lot of the time when I've pulled someone up on that myself, I'll say, hey, yeah, you look, you're, you're doing this position on the ground. And the general comment I get back is, yeah, 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 I'm just doing that now. I'll do it different in the sky. I'm sorry to say, but I've never seen that happen. I've never seen it happen. I've always seen every single person who does something on the ground in the dirt dive, guaranteed they'd do that in the sky. So if you're able to pick that up for them then, and don't be an asshole about it, but pick it up for them, run them through it, and then they can do exactly what Melissa says just go and do that homework, really get to know their body. Ah, well, I thought my shoulders were down. If you're picking them up on the ground and they can see it on the ground, they can fix this now. So automatically by them seeing their shoulders, okay, my arms are up, get them to do the wrong position. My shoulders are up, cool. Now drop them and get, when they drop them, get them to notice whether it's drop them the legs, the shoulders, the arms, whatever, get them to notice the feeling and the sensation of that release. So when they're in the sky, guaranteed they're not going to get out and do the perfect position guaranteed even if you've spoken to them they're going to get out they're going to do the same position but at least now they're aware of it now they can have practice in the sky to drop them or even as you as a coach when you point this out to them in the sky it's already been talked about they now have that awareness rather than going what's he talking about they go ah the shoulders bonk they get in air coaching straight away rather than having to wait till they get down or wait for something else in air coaching i find is hand it's really good but it takes some preparation okay that way you need to have one skill to be able to give that information in the sky and two you need to be able to prepare them so they have that knowledge of this is what you're going to do it's hard as well because sometimes as a coach you might want to give 10 15 things for them to work on sometimes the best thing to do is just one thing that's it if they're capable of doing two for sure um cool should Uh, we move on because we've got about 18 minutes or 17 yes. minutes. let's move so, on to the next one. Last but not least, it's the fourth key thing, as if we haven't sort of given people enough to think about. But last one, break-off, Mason. Cool, so break-off. So there's many different break-offs. The most important thing for break-off, what we can find, is horizontal separation and staying on your radial. So don't change. If, if your formation's here and everyone's falling at this speed, okay, oh, sorry, if falling at this speed, and then they break off. You don't want to try and dive deeper than what the formation's already at. You also don't want to track off and float higher than what the formation's at. So really trying to keep that same level of formation of what you're on and tracking off on this same uh, plane as, as what the other ones are. So trying to not dive down, trying to not cut across each, each other's paths, all this kind of stuff. For angle jumps, it's the same. We're not so much, we're more tracking away from each other, but we're not trying to one track diving as they're peeling off or one peeling up. So really trying to stay on it. You'll see a shot in a sec of what what I'm talking about with this. Um, So the first shot, you can see the two different ones, delta track and flat track. Okay, so we all get told a delta track and a flat track in our AF or in our static line. I've done static line, like I think looking at a lot of the names and faces, a lot of you guys did as well. Um, And a lot of others done AF, but we, we, we learn both. Okay, so Generally, after the AF course, we don't really use delta anymore. We are slowly bringing the delta format, the delta position back into tracking and angles as it's very similar to uh, a lot of tunnel stuff we're doing. So we're finding we're having good results using these same skills 
for transitioning into the sky. But at the same time, we want to try and track off in a flat track, I find is probably best. And you can see those two positions on the sky in real view, as well as the diagram view. Um, and the, in the diagram, you can see how they're diving more and the flat track. So the next one, this is a prime example of free fly jump tracking off. And you can see all three people are pretty much on the same plane. So we don't really see one diving more than the other. And what I'm looking at for here, I'm looking at the, the angle of their torso, not so much the leg, but generally the angle of their torsos is what's going to give away the angle and the pitch of what they're tracking and where they're tracking. And I think the next slide's yours, yours Melissa. Yes, it is. And I just wanted to observe that if people were seeing the, the transparent figure on the, the list uh, at the beginning of this topic, it was Kate Vaughan. Yay! Um, so um, in, in our disciplines, uh, Big Way, FS, team stuff, um, tracking is critical. Um, being able to track on, a, on an axis, on a radial, on a level, uh, without diving down um, is, is what saved lives. Um, unfortunately, you guys will all be aware, it's not too many years ago now that we lost Bogdan. Um, and, and the challenge of people moving off student status and into a team environment has never been so real. We need to help people understand that what they learned in their app and derails is often something that's very functional. It, it helps them get a sense of what it's like to travel forward. But now they need to finesse those skills in order to be safe with other people and actually learn more about how to create pressure in their body, how to manage the air so that they can actually fly relative to others. And as Mason says, try and at least stay on that same level of the formation as opposed to going down, uh, because there just isn't space in the sky for that kind of thing. And if you then have a canopy malfunction or some kind of issue, and you come close to someone else, you've not taken advantage of the opportunity to break off. Um, so I think really critical from a safety point of view. Those were our four key topics and they kind of lead you from top to bottom of the skydive. Now we acknowledge it doesn't talk about the canopy stuff, that's a separate topic, we could talk for hours about that. Um, it's just as important from a safety point of view and a transition of your student status, more canopy skills, but we did say we were going to focus on body flight. And we've picked up some really pretty fundamental things that we're hoping you guys can all do now in, in your engagement with students. These are some of the things that we picked up on. Um, we've also mentioned giving people time to plan. We've also mentioned uh, giving people a little bit of, um, you know, in-air training because they've had time to plan and you've got a bit of a, a connection with someone. But you'll see here that we're not asking you to change anything wildly technical. We're just suggesting that you can communicate differently. You can help them understand that they're on a journey. You can introduce the concept of access so they understand what they're learning and what the opportunities are when they move forward encourage them to think about stopping before they pick up the grip, explain the logic of the tracking situation and learning to flat track so it's a bit more practice that they can do. What else, as coaches and instructors out there, what else do you think, having had this conversation, what else could you do to help your students in that transition into skydiving? Anybody? Or are you willing to try these things? Do you think they'll make a difference? A lot of tumbleweed. <laughs> um, they do have some questions here. Top tips for de developing mindset. Um, do you want to go on with some... Uh, I'll let you finish first. We can get to the questions at the end. All right. For, okay. For no, other ones of that one. That, that's a good one. So we're asking or offering to you the opportunity to help people transition on their journey. Retention is a biggie for us in the sport. Mm. We're, trying to, we're trying to get people out of student status and into skydiving without them being shocked that they can't participate. Help them understand what comes next. Um, and to that end, how can they save time, money and effort going forward? Is it about jump numbers, Nathan? No, <laughs> definitely not. Um, so there's many ways we can do this. Um, obviously understand the skills you need to evolve and why. So yeah, ask, ask coaches, ask everyone. Yeah. Be, be honest. If you are a coach, uh, be honest with the flaws that you've had before and, and don't try to hide them because of what you're worried people will think about you. 
had on many camps and many DDs that I've said some shocking things that people were like, why'd you tell us that? And I, I need to be honest with my path of aggression so people know the accidents that have happened and why they happen because uh, some people, when they're young, they try to get around stuff and the rules are there for a reason. And sometimes there's not rules and, and incidents happen as well. So never be too afraid to own up to the mistakes you've made um, and express that and share that with the community because it's, it can save someone, I think. So it's really important for that. Think like an athlete. Um, this is a sport. It is a, also a great lifestyle as well but it is a sport and the more you think like an athlete the more you're going to progress for me i had a, a coach my mentor over in uh in europe uh, when i was working in the tunnel he was a, a full-time athlete beforehand and i was lucky that he instilled a lot of his knowledge onto me as well uh this is where i got a lot of my knowledge about the articulation of certain body parts how they move all this kind of stuff so really try to study as much as you can the uh, anatomy of the body because if your shoulder's not going to bend a certain way, don't do it for skydiving. It's going to hurt your shoulder. So move in the way the body should move. Learn how that works. And I guarantee you flying is going to be a lot better. Smash out the jumps with focus. So this is a good point. When I first started, I believe the way, the reason I progressed quick was because I stuck to a topic and a discipline. I didn't, I, I got angry and frustrated with my develop at certain points but for an example, I, I smashed out at an equinox. I smashed out uh, 45 jumps, just back angles. That was it. Oh, for sure, there was times that I hated it and I wanted to go do some sit fly and some belly and some stuff like this. But I stuck with it. Stick with the jumps. Do your focus. That way, if you do start having bad jumps, you can start progressing with them. You can start learning and knitting out where those issues were and fixing those. And then you're going to get the progression. Generally, when you start sucking at a discipline, after you've had a good progression, you're not actually sucking. You've just realized what you were doing wrong. And it's now it's frustrating you. So this means it's probably at a point where you're about to get a spike. So use those parts and those moments where it's frustrating. Use them as good guides to know you're probably going to get a spike just after it. And it's probably not because you're doing something wrong. It's probably just because you've realized what you were doing wrong. And now it's frustrating. It. Um, build awareness of the brain and body, same thing and get coaching. Um, coaching does help. Coaching can make it cheaper for sure. It's a little outlay in the beginning, but the cost it cuts in the end is tenfold. Like I spent on my second tunnel trip cost me about nine grand for four hours of tunnel. That was the best money I'd ever spent, hands down. Um, choose your coach carefully. That makes a big difference as well. Um, make sure, like, not always the best flies is the best coach, but choose your coach. Yeah, be choose carefully with that one. I think, Mason, there's a lot of science behind all this as well. And if, if people have got time, listen to some of the um, APF um, on hold sessions. Oh, yeah, brilliant ones on there. Sessions. It was a fantastic session with Kirsten uh, Peterson recently, a mm -hmm. psychiatrist, a psychologist, and, uh, and she gave some fantastic uh, background to some of the science behind the mental side of things, mental awareness, mental preparation, self-awareness. These things can all save time, money, and effort if you understand your own emotions, you understand your own body parts as well as your mind. So, so these are things that we can offer people and students we've given you an indication of four key things. Like that could take up a few hundred jumps to actually start dedicating your, your, your jumps to those, to those four topics and actually getting those skills and then getting some help along the way so someone can observe you and give you some outside information. Um, so hopefully that's been helpful. Um, the last topic, questions and answers, um, we do have about six minutes, which is great. Um, and Mason, do you mind if I just pick up on Robbo's question? Because it was Go for it. Go for um, it. Robbo, thanks for your question. Um, Robbo asked, um, basically, we know what it costs for an AF student. We, need, we know what they need to do to get their A certificate and how many jumps to get their B certificate. But basically, what happens next and how much would you say it actually costs to actually progress after that? Um, so everybody wants this magic figure. If you've got $10,000, you can become an X. And it's not quite as simple as that. Because um, obviously it depends if you want to, you know, have a more successful jump socially with your friends or whether you want to become an elite or an expert skydiver beyond the podium or whatever. Um, so different levels. 
Um, but there are definitely ways of saving time, money, and effort. So to Mason's point earlier, I've got enough evidence of people who've had hundreds of jumps and then come to me and done a supercharged program and got, oh my God, you know, I wish I'd done this 500 jumps ago. So you put that money calculation into the cost of the coaching. Same, I'm sure, with Down Under Dynamics, and it's basically cheaper in the short run. But you can also do lots of physical, mental preparation and training that actually helps you progress as a skydiver faster than just turning up on the drop zone and doing some fun jumps. So, Mason, you were actually going to volunteer a figure, weren't you? Yeah, I was. <laughs> so... Like Melissa and me spoke to before, we've probably both spent houses on this sport already, and I'm sure a lot of you guys have as well. Um, so it's not a cheap sport. These days, with tunnel, it can be quicker, but also with tunnel, it, it can seem quite expensive as well. We're doing 10 hours and stuff like this. It's it's really expensive. And, and this is where, same, it's hard putting a figure on it because I've seen, taught a lot of people in tunnel, a lot of camps overseas, 10 hours each student and stuff like that. Had some students do 30 hours and they still the same had some students do five hours and they're absolutely shredding so if i do it on a bit of an average uh rather than taking the two extremes i'd say you're looking to to be able to happily can participate in a i'm talking free fly wise here not not flat but to participate happily in most jumps uh, head down and say basic jumps, not flipping pieces and stuff like this. You're probably looking at about 20, 25 grand or something like this. That's including your F course. Okay. That's not separate to the F course. That's including F course and your B rolls, jumps, stuff like this. Hell, we could throw it up there if we start including gear as well. Hey, So there's, there's a lot of stuff that really come into this with figures. Um, if you're going to look at that, it's not a cheap sport. I'm not saying it's 20 grand outlay all at once. You can spend this over time. I personally, I was in the army. I got back from overseas when I was in Iraq. I had 60 grand cash. Like, what am I going to do with it? I chucked probably 20 of it into skydiving, and that's what gave me my big boost. I think that one hit all at once, consistency and currency, I find for progressing the uh, the key for most. Um, if you're consistent at something and you're current at it you're probably going to get a good progression. If you're only doing one jump every month, or sorry, one week in the month, you're probably not going to progress as much. So I recommend if you if that's what you want, outlay the money in the beginning big or save the money big. Do a big outlay, go consistent, go current, take that hit. And then over the next couple of years, then maybe, then you're only going to be doing one weekend a month or something like this. But at least that way you can keep your, your skills topped up. So you're not trying to necessarily learn more skills, but you're able to have fun with your mates. You're able to do what you want to do. And then maybe later on, then you can go and pump more money in it to get money into it to get to that next stage. Um, We've only got a couple of minutes and I'm just thinking, you know, quick question from Robo. Does that help? Well, yeah, broadly, um, I mean, when you started this off, we talked about, you know, the way drop zones operate way back when we all started mates and, you know, mm -hmm. Uh, and now we've got a different environment. Uh, forget about COVID-19. We have um, fewer drop zones. Um, we have uh, competing uh, interests such as DZs, uh, commercial DZs, very few clubs, tunnel. Um, if you want to be a player in big ways, you really got to go overseas. Um, and I guess my point is, when people come into the sport, their expectations, they see wingsuiting, for example, where somebody mm -hmm. comes to the drop zone, people do a course, two people, and they both wanted to do wingsuiting. Now, to get to wingsuiting, obviously, you've got to have several hundred jumps. That's a bit of a journey, and that really applies to any skill. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we've grappled with over the years is people getting their A licence, passing their certificate B and then not having anything to do. It's, things have developed since and you guys, um, you know, with Supercharge and the tunnel, um, there's pathways for people which didn't exist before, but these pathways cost a lot of money. And if we've got a, um, like the, the numbers of skydivers, uh, that, that are, I think it's about 2,000. 
regular skylight. If we want the sport to grow, how are we going to get the people who can afford it to go in? Or not drop off after the first couple of hundred jumps? Yeah. No, it's a good question, Robert. And, and somebody, somebody mentioned mentoring before. Yeah. Yes. And mentoring yeah. is a good one. And I think giving people pathways for the, the money that they have got, using the time, money and effort that they have got in the most efficient way. But some of that is down to getting help, having a conversation with mm -hmm. someone that they trust. So when they fall off student status, if as an instructor and coach, you could point them towards people like all these big ways, down into dynamics, supercharge, you know, people who are actually active in four-way or, or BFS or whatever their person's interest is, links to things that then you know, help people make that connection into the, the people that are in, in that next phase. I'm just going to think we've only got like one minute and I was just conscious there was another question. Mason, you were talking about a question about mindset tips. Yes, uh, there was a couple. I think Luke Everett's been answering a bunch of them on, on the chat anyway okay, for perfect. us. So it's, it's been good. So yeah, thank you for that, Luke. Well, that's perfect. Yeah, mindset yeah. yourself. Yeah, so no, thank, it, it's good. Thank you. Sorry, go on. Uh, no, yeah, I was just saying thank you. If if everyone gets a chance, like watch those two two uh, on hold sessions as well that we were saying before. Like Luke Everett's one is excellent about learning about the body, and a lot of his exercises are brilliant. I used a lot of them when I saw him doing that. That was excellent. Really good on that one, and the psychology one is the, the sports yes, psychology Peterson one. Well. On the APT, yeah. yes, absolutely brilliant. So when you glue it all together, we've got the knowledge and the expertise in our community to help people. Maybe if we could communicate slightly differently so people popped off their student status and understood how to take that journey, that next step, that would Definitely. be wonderful. I'll um, just finish and off. then we'd have more people to play with. I'll finish off that so, last part. Thank you all. Thank you, Mason. No worries. I um, just want to add one last thing at the end real quick. Um, drop zone. So weekend jumping, it's really important, not just for instructors to help. Oh, sorry. You know, yeah, you're sorry. It's not just important for instructors to help, but also sport sport jumpers as well if you see a guy sitting there at the job zone by himself go up and help him out um ask him yeah get him involved in the community because that's what we're, i think we're missing slight with these big job zones now um i was lucky i was helped out a lot because i was a gap in a small job zone but also when i went to the larger job zones i was 18 19 so i was quite happy to go and pick people's brains so um yeah pick people's brains they're a lot more happy to help than you'd think and also if you see someone sitting there go and help them Retention is key, I think, at the moment. So, yeah. Cheers, Melissa. Thank you, guys. I think Melissa's frozen. <laughs> Mason, we've got another... Ben just asked a quick question about jumpsuits. Um, what are your views on jumpsuits for each discipline? Most people don't really want to buy them anymore. Yeah, don't... Uh, wear jumpsuits, they're good. Yeah, I wear a jumpsuit every jump. Every jump I wear one. Um, or, sorry, I try to wear one as many times as I can. They're, they're the best for dress for success. Yeah, dress for success. It's all, all cool and nice being cool in your in your t-shirt and shorts, but it's not cool when you're holding everyone else's jumps up. Dress for success. Not baggy, not tight, medium. Yeah. Cool. I think that all could right. be it, guys. Good on you, Mason. And no worries. Cheers, Wade. I think everyone's starting to drop out. <laughs> That's fine. Um, okay. Thanks again, Mason. Melissa, if no, she's just disappeared. Okay. Um, thank you everyone for coming for this episode. Um, in the next couple of weeks, we've got um, Cyprus. We're still confirming with Cyprus and NZ Aero Sports. We're trying to get a tour of their loft, which would be good. Otherwise, um, Chris Stewart. I think said he'd be happy to come on. He's a test jumper for NZ Aerosport, so he's happy to come and have a chat. Um, next week, we're going to <clears throat> give a different time slot a go. So 7 p.m. next week. Um, we've got confirmed for next week is Mike Tibbetts and Captain Oates. Captain Oates is Mike's dog. Um, they'll be talking about considerations specifically for fun jumpers before getting back in the air after this period of uncurrency. Um, and he'll also chat a, a little bit about why sports jumpers should become instructors and what they would get out of it. Um, and on that note, um, Luke's just said he's happy to do another 
presentation as well, which would be good, Luke. I think uh, we'll talk a bit more about that because your last one we had a lot of great feedback about. So yeah, we might go down that path again. That'd be great. Thanks for the offer. And on that note, everybody, stay safe, stay happy, wash your hands. See you later.